Hi guys, it's Pete aka on a retro tip, back with another entry in my developer spotlight series. This time it's another Amiga era developer whose games I played a great deal, Bullfrog. Bullfrog Productions was a British video game developer founded in 1987 by Les Edgar and Peter Molyneux. The pair first met in 1982. Les had just opened a computer retail outlet in Guildford, focusing on the sales of Tandy machines and later BBC Apple and Olivetti. Peter turned up looking for a computer that could use the database software he'd been writing for his employers. This meeting proved to be the start of a long friendship, and the pair had similar ambitions and both craved success. The retail side of the industry didn't excite Les, so they joined forces and opened their own software company, Taurus Impact Systems, creating bespoke databases for the commercial market. Sometime later, Commodore contacted them, mistaking Taurus Impact Systems for another company named Taurus, T-O-R-U-S, and sent them six prototype Amiga machines. Les and Peter didn't inform Commodore of their mistake, instead taking on the job, and they created a database program for the Amiga called Acquisition. This gave them a bit of cash to play with, and they used it to found Bullfrog Productions, the name was inspired by Taurus, the Latin word for bull, and Les's daughter's love of frogs. With the Amiga becoming quite the force on the gaming scene, it occurred to Les that they could write games themselves, but sadly they didn't know how. Then in a stroke of good fortune, a friend of theirs had just finished work on a game for the Atari ST and needed someone to handle the Amiga port. That game was Druid 2 Enlightenment, released in 1987. This Amiga conversion was Bullfrog's first game, and they basically blagged their way through it, copying various elements from the Commodore 64 version. Druid 2 is a Gauntlet-style shooter, and was actually inspired by Gauntlet. Druid 2 was published by Firebird, whereas all of Bullfrog's subsequent games would be published by Electronic Arts. The following year came their first original game, Fusion, released for Amiga and Atari ST in 1988. Fusion is a top-down scrolling shooter, with the player controlling either a ground-based vehicle or a spacecraft across 13 levels. Molyneux handled most of the programming and design for Fusion, with artist Glenn Corpse providing the majority of the graphics and animation, and David Hanlon the soundtrack. It wasn't a commercial success, and according to Glenn Corpse, Fusion's profits combined with those from Druid 2 only brought in a fraction of the money needed to pay the wage bill. The next game was one that really got them noticed, and a game which to this day is synonymous with Bullfrog, Populous. Released in 1989 initially for Amiga, Populous was ported to several home computers including Atari ST, Acorn Archimedes and DOS, among others, and many home consoles including the Mega Drive, Super Nintendo and PC Engine. Populous was regarded by many as the first god game, the player assumes the role of a deity who must lead followers through direction, manipulation and divine intervention with the goal of eliminating the followers of the opposing deity. The game is displayed in a quite unique isometric viewpoint and consists of over 500 levels with each level being a piece of land which contains both the players and enemy followers. Although I do remember any level after 50 being balls hard. The play area is laid out on a tabletop on which are command icons, the world map which is depicted as an open book, and a slider bar which indicates how much divine power or mana the player has. The player must defeat the enemy followers and increase the population of their own followers by using their divine powers before moving on to the next level. Rumour has it that Bullfrog developed the game using a board game that they had created using Lego, which was essentially a prototype of the game's play area. Peter Molyneux admits that this didn't help much with the balancing of the game, but served as a nice publicity tool nonetheless. The most basic divine power is manipulating the land, wherein the player can raise and lower the landscape. The primary function of this power is to create flat land on which your followers can build. The more they build, the more followers they produce, which in turn increases the player's mana. Increasing the mana level unlocks additional divine powers that allow the player to interact further with the landscape and the population. The powers include the ability to cause natural disasters like earthquakes and floods, create swamps and volcanoes, and turn basic followers into more powerful knights. During testing it became apparent that they would need a level cheat, as there simply wasn't enough time to play through all of the 500 levels. 
It then became apparent that they hadn't added an end screen to the game, probably because it was unfathomable that anyone would actually get there, so they repurposed the screen from between the levels into an ending screen. Populous received almost universal critical acclaim, with critics praising the game's graphics, design, sounds and replayability. It was released at the same time that Salman Rushdie's The Satanic Verses controversy was happening, and Peter Molyneux has stated that Bullfrog was contacted by the Daily Mail and warned that the good versus evil nature of the game would lead to them receiving a similar fatwa, although this thankfully never happened. Populous won several Game of the Year awards and cemented Bullfrog as serious contenders in the industry. Next in 1990 came Flood, a platform game for the Amiga and Atari ST. The whole premise of this game is rather bizarre, and its quirky humour and experimental gameplay may have contributed to its commercial failure. The objective is to collect all the litter and find the exit to the level. The game was not a huge commercial success and contained rather experimental styles of gameplay for its time, as well as a quirky sense of humour. The player controls a small green creature called Quiffy, who lives underground in a series of sewers and tunnels. Quiffy must reach the surface whilst collecting litter, all the while trying to outrun the impending danger of flooding. Quiffy can walk on walls and ceilings, and can swim although can only breathe above water. During each level you're followed by the ghost of your aunt Matilda. She copies your movements exactly and starts off about 15 seconds behind you, however she is very slightly faster than you and will eventually catch you, and any contact will cause Quiffy to take damage. Like I said, bizarre. Most levels contain taps, which fill the level with water and will cause Quiffy to drown after time, hence the game's title. The physics of the water were rather advanced for the time, with the water flowing to the lowest available point. Quiffy can obtain several weapons, including a boomerang, a flamethrower and shuriken. The levels feature various different enemies and traps, which add to the challenge of outrunning Aunt Matilda's ghost. There are also numerous items to be utilised, including parachutes, balloons, which cause Quiffy to float upwards, and a plunger, which stops all the taps from flowing temporarily. Later the same year came Powermonger for Amiga, ST, and other home computers, as well as Sega's Mega Drive and Mega CD, and the Super Nintendo. Powermonger is a real-time strategy game which uses the same engine as Populous but is displayed as a 3D map, although the people, trees and other game objects are 2D sprites. For the time, Powermonger had a pretty advanced AI. Each person seems to have a mind of their own and will go about his or her job, be it fishing, farming, etc., without any player intervention. There's also a query tool that can be used to see the name, sex, age, allegiance, vital stats, hometown and equipment for any given person you click on. While the player cannot form the land like in Populous, actions can still have some limited effect on the environment. For example, if a large area is deforested, the weather will change causing increase in rain or snowfall, making movement slower. The player starts each map with a small number of soldiers and sometimes also a few towns already under their control. To win the map, the balance of power needs to be tipped completely to the player's side, which is represented by a scale below the minimap. By conquering most or all of the towns on the map, and killing any opponent captains. Once a town is under the player's control, locals can be drafted into the player's army, and bigger towns or enemy armies can be taken on. Some of the bigger towns also have neutral captains, and if these survive the battle, they can come under the player's command as well. The player can only control as many armies as captains, so it's important to keep them alive. If a captain is killed, his army is disbanded and his surviving soldiers go back to their town of origin. Unlike the player's main army, which the main character commands, the captains have a delay before their commands are executed. The further away from the player's main character they are, the longer it takes for their orders to reach them. Food is the most important resource in the game, which can be obtained in various ways, including slaughtering sheep and bartering with towns. Towns can also be used to manufacture equipment, such as weapons like bows and pikes, which the soldiers can then equip. Powermonger won Computer Gaming World's 1991 Strategy Game of the Year award, and was ranked the 32nd best game of all time by Amiga Power. Next in 1991 came a sequel to Populous, Populous 2, Trials of the Olympian Gods, 
to Amiga ST and again various other home computers and the Mega Drive and Super Nintendo. Again a god game wherein the player guides his followers against the followers of an enemy god. Unlike its predecessor which featured nondescript deities, Populous 2 is based on Greek mythology. The player is a demigod, one of Zeus's countless children with mortal women, and has to battle one Greek deity at a time until finally facing his father. Zeus has promised to let the player into the pantheon on Olympus if he can survive all the battles. Populous 2 has many more divine intervention effects than the original, with 29 as opposed to the original's 8. These are divided into 6 categories, earth, water, wind, fire, plants and people. The 6 categories have their own respective mana meter, which needs to be filled to a certain level to enable the use of certain powers. Mana is again generated by population existing over time, the larger the population, the more mana is generated. Use of a power will deplete a set amount of mana, and repeated use of the more devastating powers will drain the player's mana entirely. Similar to how the knights worked in the original game, each effect category includes a hero, which allows the transformation of a leader into one of six legendary figures from Greek mythology, who will wander the map attacking enemies or performing some other wicked art. If either side controls a certain percentage of the map, usually 75%, ancient Greek monsters are unleashed, such as the Colossus or Medusa, which will wander the map leaving a trail of destruction. These monsters are invincible and will attack the player and enemies alike, and so are essentially a way to make the player hurry up and complete the map. Populous 2 features a whopping 1000 maps. Bullfrog were quiet for a while now until 1993, only releasing two free shareware games which came on Amiga magazine cover discs. The first was Bullfrogger in 1991 which came on a cover disc for issue 6 of Amiga Power in 1991. This was essentially a Frogger clone. The next was Psycho Santa in 1993 which came on a cover disc with issue 52 of the One Amiga. A bit of a bizarre game, crossing side-scrolling shooter segments with sections on a pogo stick, wherein Santa has to grab presents off a tree. The side-scrolling sections involve dropping presents onto houses while avoiding obstacles and enemies, but it can be rather frustrating getting the aim right when dropping the presents. Gameplay is a bit repetitive and the sound effects aren't great, but it's a free game and a bit of a laugh. After this quiet period, Bullfrog came back with what is my favourite of their games, and one of my all-time favourite games for that matter, Syndicate. Syndicate was released in 1993 for the Amiga and numerous other home computers and consoles, although the console versions are so cut down that they're abysmal in my opinion. Set in 2096, Syndicate is an isometric real-time tactical game set in a cyberpunk dystopian future in which huge corporations rule the world and they rule with iron fists as their bidding is carried out by squads of ruthless cyborgs. The player controls a one to four person team of cyborg agents around various cities and must complete a set task which could be an assassination, purging an area of an enemy syndicate's agents, rescue and escort missions and sometimes persuading scientists to work for your corporation through the use of the fantastic Persuadatron. This weapon can convince civilians to join you and they'll follow you around thereafter. Once a sufficiently large group has been persuaded, even enemy agents can be persuaded to join you. This is useful for replenishing your numbers if several of your agents have been killed and a huge group of persuaded civilians can also act as a handy human shield. After each mission the player can research new technology such as augmented body parts for the cyborgs, enhancing their performance or research new weapons. The more money invested into research, the quicker that research will be completed. Beginning with basic weapons like pistols, the player will slowly upgrade to more advanced weaponry such as the minigun, sniper rifle and the fantastic gorse gun. Each agent has 8 slots in which to carry weapons or medikits which can also be purchased. Money to invest in research and to buy new weapons is earned through taxation, with the player choosing how much to tax each conquered territory on the world map. Higher taxes mean higher profits, but would also increase the likelihood of revolt. 
A revolting territory will have to be recaptured by visiting it once more and completing a mission, which I think was usually eliminating enemy agents who'd moved in. The reason that my memory is a bit hazy on this is I didn't really have to do it that often, as there was a nice little exploit to gain money quickly. As the in-game timer ticked on even when in the game's world map and not on a mission, I could leave my computer on the map screen overnight and earn millions, as each in-game day yielded new tax income from my territories. So that's why I rarely had revolting territories, as I could afford to keep the taxes low and keep the people happy. Cheating I know, but I'm sure we all did it back in the day. Syndicate gets really hard during the later levels, but it's a welcome challenge and perseverance will be rewarded. It's a game that I still play a lot and is aged pretty well. The music is atmospheric and the almost Orwellian storyline is as relevant as ever. In 1996, Syndicate was ranked as the 7th best Amiga game by Amiga Power. Next up was another game for which Bullfrog are quite well known, Magic Carpet. This was released for DOS in 1994 and also the PlayStation and Saturn. Magic Carpet is essentially a first person shooter wherein the player controls a wizard flying on the titular Magic Carpet. The carpet can be controlled in three dimensions and it's impossible to crash as the carpet will automatically rise over obstacles. The game was praised at the time for its impressive graphics and gameplay. The player rides the carpet over various terrain types and must destroy both monsters and rival wizards and collect mana. There are 50 levels presented as small spherical worlds, with the aim being to build a castle and fill said castle with a certain percentage of the world's mana, which is collected by balloons once obtained by the player. Mana is obtained from destroyed monsters and the more mana is stored in the castle the more powerful the spells that the player can cast. The castle also acts as a base in which the player can restore the wizard's health and mana and also as a reset point should they die. There are a total of 24 spells in Magic Carpet, two of which can be equipped at any one time, one in each hand. These range from destructive spells such as fireballs and lightning bolts to defensive spells like shields and healing. There are also terrain altering spells reminiscent of Populous and Powermonger such as volcanoes and earthquakes. Enemies that the player will take on include seven computer controlled wizards and a variety of monsters. The PlayStation and Saturn ports were slightly abridged with fewer spells and lacked a multiplayer mode and the Saturn port being slightly inferior graphically due to the PlayStation's 3D handling, but both included the Hidden Wells expansion adding another 25 levels. Another pretty well known one next, Theme Park, released in 1994 for Amiga, DOS, Mac and numerous consoles, although mostly the following year. Theme Park is a theme park construction and management simulator in which the player designs and runs an amusement park with the goal of making money and creating theme parks worldwide. This title was hugely popular, selling over 15 million copies and inspired several other games in the theme series. The player starts with a plot of land and a few hundred grand and must build their theme park into a profitable business. Money spent on buildings, rides, shops and hiring staff and is earned through the sale of tickets, merchandise and food and drink. Available shops include those selling food and drink like ice cream stands and games like arcades. These shops have a certain level of customization, for example the ability to increase the amount of sugar or salt in certain foods to increase customer return rates or drink sales respectively. There are over 30 attractions ranging from the very simple bouncy castle to complex rides like roller coasters. Rides require maintenance and will explode if left unattended causing harm to park goers. The available rides and shops are minimal at first with the player needing to research more advanced ones later on, similar to the research feature in Syndicate. Research not only unlocks new rides and shops, but can also make rides more durable and staff more efficient. Staff available for employment include entertainers, security guards, mechanics and handymen, and a lack of any one of these employment types can result in serious problems. Theme Park's gameplay offers three levels of complexity, from the very basic to the full level wherein the player must also handle logistical aspects of the running of the park, including managing negotiations and stocks and shares. 
The goal is to increase the park's value and available money so that it can be sold. The player can then purchase a new plot on which to build a better theme park. Peter Molyneux stated that he came up with the idea of creating theme park because he felt the business genre was worth pursuing, perhaps wanting to expand on his previous business simulation Entrepreneur, which he made pre-Bullfrog. Theme Park received critical acclaim with exceptional scores across the board. The gameplay, graphics and addictiveness in particular were highly praised. Theme Park is considered by many to be an absolute classic and I have fond memories of whiling away hours and hours building parks as a kid. One of the earliest sim games and in my opinion still one of the best. Later in 1994 Bullfrog released an expansion for Syndicate called Syndicate American Revolt for Amiga and DOS, which added an additional 21 missions. The Amiga version was available exclusively through the merchandise section of Amiga Format magazine. The game takes place during the 22nd century after the events of Syndicate. The entire world is controlled by a mega corporation called Eurocorp, and the player takes control of a Eurocorp executive trying to quash a rebellion in North and South America. In 1994, Peter Molyneux had become a vice president and consultant at Bullfrog's publisher, Electronic Arts, when they purchased a portion of Bullfrog's shares. In January 1995, EA acquired the studio. Moving into 1995, Bullfrog developed Tube for DOS, but it was rumoured to have been a test for a new Bullfrog employee, and so was only released as shareware. Tube sees the player racing through an endless tunnel and must pick up enough speed to beat the track before the time runs out whilst collecting weapon upgrades and destroying obstacles. Bullfrog's next game was quite the departure from their previous releases, although it was based on Magic Carpet's code. That was High Octane, released in 1995 for Windows, DOS, PlayStation and Saturn. High Octane is a combat racing game notable for its wide and open tracks and for its speed. High Octane is rumoured to have begun as something that some of the Bullfrog programmers were working on coding in their free time, but Bullfrog were under pressure from EA to finish development of Dungeon Keeper, so they decided to develop and release High Octane to take some of the pressure off, allegedly completing the game within 8 weeks. There are 6 hovercraft vehicles from which to choose, with varying attributes such as speed, armour, firepower and weight, and also six tracks on which to race. Two weapons are available, a minigun and missiles. The minigun has unlimited ammo but warms up while firing and must cool down if it overheats, and missiles cause more damage but are available in limited quantities. Certain parts of the track allow to recharge vehicles fuel, shields or ammo, and there are also power-ups to collect. Certain track features change during the course of the race, for example opening up shortcuts. High Octane's success suffered due to the release of Wipeout from Psygnosis, which is a similar and also superior game and was also released for the PlayStation and Saturn in 1995. Again in 95 came a sequel to Magic Carpet, Magic Carpet 2 The Netherworlds, this time solely to DOS. This followed the same format as the first game, albeit with a few improvements to reduce the monotony and aid story progression, such as the addition of nighttime, underground and hidden levels. Perhaps the most welcome change is that the player progresses by completing various missions, rather than by simply collecting mana. The first of two games released in 1996 was Gene Wars for Windows and DOS, a real-time strategy game. In addition to real-time strategy mechanics, Gene Wars also featured terrain editing and cross-species breeding. The player must build bases in various worlds in which to capture, research and subsequently breed animals, as well as grow and harvest plants. The properties of these flora and fauna can then be used to combat several environmental issues, enemies or to complete certain tasks. Attributes possessed by different species can then be blended through cross-species breeding. Although appreciated for its visuals and sound, Gene Wars was let down by some frustrating game mechanics. Second to be released in 1996 was Syndicate Wars, a sequel to the fantastic Syndicate for Windows, DOS and PlayStation. It was created using a modified version of Magic Carpet's engine. 
A Saturn version was also fully developed but never published. The game is set 95 years after the original in 2191 and follows on from the events of the American Revolt expansion. A virus in the global communications network named Harbinger has been damaging the mind control implants. Several people freed from their mental imprisonment, which the mega corporations have dubbed unguided citizens, have organised an uprising against the corporations. Syndicate Wars allows the player to rotate and pitch the angle rather than having a fixed point of view. The principles of gameplay are largely unaltered, with the player controlling the agents in much the same way as the original. A notable change is the ability to view an entire map's contents upon entering it rather than having to explore it, including the ability to see what kind of enemy resistance there will be. This allows the player to design a strategy for approaching the level beforehand. Many of the weapons are similar to the first game, with the Persuadatron of course making a comeback, although there are some new additions. The vehicles return, some of which are in the same style of the original game, and some of which are actually ripped straight from the aforementioned High Octane, and there are also some flying vehicles. Locations varied in style more than the original Syndicate, and Syndicate Wars even included in-game adverts, for example for Ghost in the Shell and Judge Dredd. Syndicate Wars is a much loved game, but I'll admit that I never really got on with it as well as the original. Perhaps because I held the original Syndicate in such high regard, and saw it as a near perfect game, that Syndicate Wars was just different enough to put me off. If you're interested in the genre or are a fan of Syndicate Wars, the game's lead designer Mike Disquette released a spiritual sequel in 2015 called Satellite Rain. Has anyone in the video game industry ever had a more apt name than Mike Disquette? I think not. That's almost as good as a lawyer called Sue Yu. In 1997 came Dungeon Keeper for Windows and DOS, a game that I've never actually played, but I know that it's one that many of you guys watching will be familiar with. Dungeon Keeper is a strategy game in which the player essentially plays the bad guy, building and maintaining a dungeon, which must be protected from invading heroes hell-bent on nicking your treasure and killing your monsters. The aim is to defeat all of the heroic forces and rival dungeon keepers across various realms. It also has a four-person multiplayer mode. Dungeon Keeper was in development for two and a half years, and during this time Peter Molyneux made the decision to leave Bullfrog after the game's completion, which was perhaps a factor in the game's high quality. Dungeon Keeper received critical praise upon release, regarded for its graphics, gameplay, atmospheric sound and dark sense of humour. Following Molyneux's announcement that he would leave after finishing the game, he was asked to leave the EA offices. Wanted to complete the development process, he had the team move to his house to work on the game. He left the company in August 1997 to found Lionhead Studios, partly due to his annoyance at corporate meetings and responsibilities that arose after EA's takeover, stating that he wanted to make, quote, the coolest game ever. Other members of the studio founded Mucky Foot Productions in 1997. In July 1997, the then Prime Minister Tony Blair wrote an article in the Guardian newspaper entitled Britain Can Remake It, in which he praised several British companies, Bullfrog being one. He cited their innovation and creativity, stating these people are ambassadors for New Britain. Theme Hospital was released in 1997 for Windows and DOS and for PlayStation in 98. The second in Bullfrog's theme series, and spiritual successor to Theme Park, it's a business simulation game in which the player designs and runs a hospital. The aim is to cure the patients of their, often hilarious, inflictions. Diseases include bloaty head, resulting in a patient's head swelling, king complex, which causes the patient to impersonate Elvis Presley, and alien DNA, which transforms the patient into an alien. Rooms are built and staff are hired, not only doctors and nurses, but other non-medical hospital staff. The player competes against computer rivals named after famous computers, real and fictional, including Holly from Red Dwarf and Deep Thought from The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Each level has targets, with goals including financial gain, patients cured and hospital value. When the goals have been met, the player has the option to move on to a new, more elaborate hospital with tougher winning conditions and more diseases present, 
or stick with their current one. Theme Hospital again took over two years to develop and was in development at the same time as Dungeon Keeper. The game received a generally positive reception with reviewers praising the graphics and humour in particular. To both Bullfrog and EA's surprise, Theme Hospital was a huge commercial success, selling over 4 million copies worldwide. As well as the 1998 PlayStation port, a Saturn version was planned, but subsequently scrapped. 1998 saw the release of a new Populous game, Populous The Beginning, for Windows, with a PlayStation port coming the following year. The series actually inspired the term God Game, Another God style strategy game and the third in the Populous series, Populous The Beginning was a departure from the format of its predecessors. This time around, the player takes control of a shaman commanding a tribe rather than as a god. The setting is also different, taking place not on Earth, but in a solar system consisting of 25 planets of varying terrain. Throughout the 25 missions of the campaign, the player leads their tribe across a solar system, dominating enemy tribes and tapping new sources of magic with the ultimate goal of the shaman attaining godhood herself. It was the first in the series to use true 3D computer graphics, with Bullfrog deliberately waiting four years from the release of the second game so that technology could advance sufficiently to produce a different enough game. Populous The Beginning plays very differently from earlier titles and received mixed reviews Reviewers noted the excellent graphics, while complaints were directed at the artificial intelligence and the indecision in game design between a real-time strategy title and a god game. The player commands various types of followers, with each having its own pros and cons in battle, and spells are available, again including terraforming and natural disasters. The aim is usually to eliminate all the opposing followers, although this can be achieved in various ways. The game was criticised for its simplicity, controls and repetitiveness. Next is the only game on the list that I'd never even heard of, let alone played, Theme Aquarium, released for PlayStation in 1998, although as a Japanese exclusive. It was later ported to Windows as simply Aquarium, which did see a European release. With gameplay in a similar vein to the rest of the Theme series, and graphics akin to Theme Hospital, Theme Aquarium sees the player building and running a successful aquarium attraction, similar to Theme Park. Sea life can either be bought or caught, and the game includes familiar aspects like the hiring of staff and maintenance in the form of tending to the animals. Being originally a Japanese exclusive, this one is rather obscure. 1999 saw the release of the sequel to 97's Dungeon Keeper, appropriately titled Dungeon Keeper 2, for Windows. Another strategy game in which the player again takes on the role of a dungeon keeper, building and defending a dungeon from the would-be heroes that invade it, as well as from other keepers. The game follows the same format as the original, but adds several new elements such as rooms and objectives. During the single player campaign, the player recovers portal gems from each area in order to open a portal to the surface, although you can build a dungeon without fixed objectives and network multiplayer is supported. A PlayStation version and a sequel, Dungeon Keeper 3, were in development but were cancelled. Dungeon Keeper 2 received critical acclaim, particularly praised for its improved graphics and AI. The studio's last three games were Theme Park World, also known as Sim Theme Park in North America, in 1999, Theme Park Inc., known as Sim Coaster in North America in 2001, and finally a conversion of Quake 3 Revolution for the PS2 in 2001. Bullfrog Productions was finally incorporated into EA on the 31st of August 2001 upon the formation of EA UK, effectively closing the studio. Since then, many former Bullfrog employees remain in the industry, with Peter Molyneux staying at Lionhead Studios until the formation of 22 Cans in February 2012. Les Edgar later became Vice President of EA's European studio, and has subsequently all but left the industry. In 2001, EA made a deal to bring many of Bullfrog's games to GOG, 
so you can buy many of them there if you're interested, including my favourite, Syndicate. So that's a relatively brief history of Bullfrog Productions and its games, another Amiga era developer of which I have very fond memories. Let me know in the comments if you played any of these games and your opinions and experiences of them. Thanks for watching!